Welcome to the briefing session of the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners. This briefing is for Thursday, August 19th. Yes, you heard correctly. Thursday, August 19th, right around the corner. And to get all the information that we have to have and discuss everything, I'll turn the meeting over to our county manager, Dudley Watts. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon again. So what we have today, or we'll introduce the items for the August 19th meeting, and if you remember, uh, because we've got an off week there with the net, with the NCACC conference, um, we'll have a we'll have a, a little break in the session here. But anyway, so it is for the August nineteenth meeting. Um, we do have uh, three discussion items, but I thought we'd go ahead and get through the agenda first, which is a little lighter agenda than the cycle that we just came off of. So, without further ado, I'll go ahead and dive into it. Hopefully, we can get through it fairly quickly. Um, so the first item is a public hearing to consider the expenditure of county general funds for an economic development project and authorizing execution of an agreement with the company and you've got the associated resolution and Kyle Haney will review. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so I'll, I'll just as a reminder, um, with the last one we did, we did change the policy. So we will not be revealing the company's name until that public hearing date, but I'll give you some preliminary details with a much uh, more extensive uh, presentation on the 19th. Uh, but this is a uh, resolution approving an incentive uh, for a company um, to relocate its nutritional supplement uh, manufacturing as well as corporate headquarters uh, to Forsyth County. The project would invest $21,738,940 in building and machinery and equipment and create 263 new full-time jobs with a minimum uh, or average wage of at least $46,377 a year. The five-year 50% incentive on this would be $327,450. Happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? Thank you, Kyle. Right, thank you. All right, item two is the approval of the minutes for the meeting of July 29th. Obviously, we'll get those uh, uh, the next uh, over the next cycle. Um, item three is a public session. Item four is an amendment to the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget orders. It increases the capital reserve fund transfer to debt service fund by $50,000 and decreases the budget reserve. You got an associated amendment with that. I'll just turn it over to Lee Plunkett to review this item. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. The two amendments before you, two amendments before you are uh, my mea culpa. <laughs> um, so during the last two bond sales, at the end of the year, we re refunded quite a bit of bonds um, issuances. And when we were implementing our debt book software as a part of our ERP, I came across the maturity that was not included in the refunding um, that we owe debt service on this year. Uh, the amount is about eight hundred fifty thousand. Uh, luckily, there were some savings in our. Uh, bond sale for our 2021 lobs of 800,000. So we really only need $50,000 to cover all the debt service payments for this fiscal year. Um, working with Kyle, we came up with a resolution to reallocate some funds within the capital reserve fund so we can avoid impact in the general fund budget. And so we're able to, to get the $50,000 needed to fully cover the debt service. And I guess what I'd say is um, I, we really appreciate um, you uh, approving the debt part of that software in the ERP um, because had we not had that, we might not have called it at the same time. And so um, it, it just goes to the value of that. And as you all know, we've got the debt level and plans create a level of com complexity that is um, kind of unheard of, and this will help us track that as we as we move along. So thank you, Lee. And I appreciate you bringing it. I appreciate you implementing that part of it so quickly in the fiscal year because it could have gotten us jammed up a little bit. It was very helpful. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lee. All right. Agenda item five is a resolution designating the Piedmont Triad Regional Council as the lead area agency on aging for Forsyth County for state fiscal years two, 2023 and 2024. You got an associated resolution. I'll turn it over to Kyle Wolf. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this agenda item is uh, is one that we do uh, pretty much every year, and it is designated in PTRC as the lead area agency on aging for Forsyth County, as well as authorizing submission of the FY22 Home and Community Care Block Grant uh, County Funding Plan for older adults, uh, submitting that to the state. Uh, as the lead area agency on aging, it's their primary responsibility is to plan and coordinate the development of the county funding plan. And so the total amount of uh, home and community care block grant funding for FY22 is $1,903,347. And you can see there's a, a um, included, the county funding plan is included, so you can see the, uh, the breakdown of, of how those funds will be allocated uh, in FY22. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? I, I looked at that chart 
Uh -huh. So I, I looked at the chart, and quite frankly, I don't understand some of the some of the columns in it, what exactly they mean, and and on and there's some that list the. It's pretty clear with the, the 1.9 million. I see that, but but the required local match, those parts are though those are already included in our budget in a different way, right? Correct. Yes. It will. The, I mean, when, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, as far as like the top two, the thirty-four thousand and the and the twenty-two hundred. For as far as the money that's coming to Forsyth, to to DSS through the Home and Community Care Block Grant, it's really just those those top two um, lines in column B that you're looking at. Yes, and I'm just right. trying to I'm just trying to get the where that, for example, the thirty-four nine six. I'll tell you my confusion. Sure. The thirty-four nine the thirty-four nine sixty-nine. Where does it come from compared to, like, for example, we moved down to the Shepherd Center, which is a third line down, the third and fourth line. Their required local match is the 72, 22, and 35, 56. And, and I do know that in our special appropriations, we give the Shepherd Center at both, uh, you know, in Winston and in Kernersville an amount of money. It's not coming out of that amount of money. So is this a, I'm trying to get at what pot are the matching local funds coming from? So the so the, this required local match. Um, I mean, so essentially, the Shepherd Center for Winston Salem they'll receive sixty five thousand out of the Home and Community Care Block Grant um, funding from PTRC. I mean, it, it does not come through the county. That's uh, it, uh, those funds flow directly from PTRC. Right. And so when they when they requested their funds, they were required to match that with the seventy two twenty two. Our funds that, that the county gives to um, the Shepherd Center are for it's for operating support, but it also uh, is for they've 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 said they they could show that as their match. I think well, I don't know if they can. I don't know if they can. I don't know if that's what they're showing for their match, but I can find out. I think what they're showing. Um, I would look. At, I would say that the the funding that we give to the Shepherd Center of Winston Salem, it's operating support to them. And when they submit their request to us during the budget process, they also will tell us we are planning on doing X, Y, and Z with those funds. And it's not. Um, they don't say that they're going to use uh, any portion of that for a local match for home and community care block grant funding. But but PTRC is making it available to them sixty five thousand. And they have to show a seventy-two hundred dollar match, and they're going to show seventy-two hundred dollars that they're doing something to prove that match to PTRC, right? Um, yes, it's because it, and, and eventually to the state. I mean, because so, well, this is yeah. yeah well, yeah, yes, the, the, uh, PTRC is just managing it. That's right. Got it. So, so for us with DSS, which is the first two, then the match there is coming out of a different pot then. Us, right, and so, and I'm asking where that shows up in our budget, the match that's provided for the block grant. Uh, I mean, it's just it's within the DSS budget. I, I will, I can, I'll have to go back and look and see exactly what we said would be our local match. But it is just, I believe it is essentially, you know, we have uh, in the DSS budget. Um, you know, it's a $40 million budget. Obviously, that's not all county dollars, but there are a certain, I mean, with from that county dollar settlement or the, from the county dollar portion, I'm sure they're able to show that portion as the local match. Some, somewhere in there. Yeah. Because, I mean, we can get that for you. I mean, fairly good detail. Okay, fine. And then the, the, the last thing really has to do with some of just the terminology of, you know, you know, projected, uh, you know, block grant units, projected reimbursement rate, projected clients, and projected unit totals. Well, the clients, I'm figuring is straightforward. You know, like 128 clients will be involved in that very first one with DSS. The second one, there are only eight clients involved. However, I, I, I don't know what the, what the, what the, there's some kind of unit of service. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious whether, what that is, is that, is that, are those individual, in, in, they're not. They're not people. If there are 128 clients getting 15,358 units, and they're getting some kind of reimbursement. I realize this is in the weeds, but I'm kind of curious. What kind of? What is this? Yeah. What is this stuff? I can get. I will get more clarification for you. I know when 
We do, you know, so if you, if we contracted out our in-home aid program, if you remember um, a couple of years ago, and so we contract with um, two or three providers for our in-home aid. And I remember, uh, I, I just remember from looking at the contracts, they talk about units. I don't want to, I don't want to say that it's, you know, they're ours, but they might be, I can get it you, might those, be. I can get you that information. Yeah, I'm just kind of, I was just kind of curious. And then, and what the, what is the, who determine, what are these projected reimbursements and rates and who determines them? I mean, I don't want to belabor all this, but the chart is not very clear. What's, what all that, what that means. Okay. I'll get you some more clarification next week or the next okay. uh, Thanks. two weeks. I, I think it'll be helpful to have Adrian sure. maybe come in because Adrian's going to be the one who's going to translate that into area agency on aging and state. Um, in, in, in sort of the state world, so absolutely, yeah, we'll, we'll get Adrian in. That'd be great. All right. Any other questions on that? I'm sorry. Hmm. All right. If not, item six is a resolution selecting a construction manager at risk and authorizing execution of a contract for pre-construction phase services for the Tanglewood Clubhouse project. Um, I will turn it over to Damon, but I think he and James Anderson are going to tag team on this one. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, so before James Anderson presents the staff recommendations for the uh, construction manager at risk for the clubhouse, um, we wanted to uh, share with you a brief update of the project progress, uh, design inspiration for the new clubhouse, and some of the next steps. Uh, the current Tanglewood Clubhouse was completed in 1973, and as uh, many of you know, served as the host for the 1974 PGA Championship. Lee Trevino won, and Jack Nicklaus placed second in. Um, it also served as the uh, Vantage um, host from 87 to 2002. Uh, so the existing clubhouse has served a significant role in the park's development, um, and replacing it will avoid significant repairs that will be due, uh, make it handicap accessible, uh, right size with well thought out adjacencies, um, and will match the park's aesthetic. Uh, the following images that I'm going to share with you are what the design team um, staff are using as a concept um, based on the, the um, survey that they've taken of facilities at the park. To date, a uh, stitch design team was selected uh, in March and serve as the uh, lead designer for this project. Uh, they also have a golf facility specialist, which is a Quo Diedrich Kai out of uh, Georgia. Uh, Stimmo Landscape is serving as the landscape architects. And they've assessed the current clubhouse and reviewed other facilities at, at Tanglewood. Uh, Stitch's team has held two meetings with county staff, uh, with the pro shop manager, the golf professional, uh, our retired golf tournament coordinator, uh, the food service contractor, uh, parks and recreation staff, general services staff, and county management. Those meetings were on the 15th of June and July 22nd. And then they've also um, uh, participated, Stitch has, in the interviews for the construction manager, um, which is why uh, James Anderson will come up shortly to talk to you about that recommendation for who the construction manager at risk would, um, uh, what the recommendation would be from the staff for that uh, role. So the following are some images of uh, existing facilities at Tanglewood Park and then the clubhouse, and then uh, we'll share with you what the renderings are of the early um, design concepts from Stitch. So the, uh, the first uh, image you see there, everybody recognizes, kind of the manor house, kind of an iconic building at Tanglewood Park that people are very familiar with, former home of Will Reynolds. Uh, this is a Tanglewood stable. Uh, it's kind of an example of uh, stables throughout the park, look very similar. This is Walnut Hall, uh, although not white with a green roof. Uh, it kind of fits into the environment where it's located, a kind of a board and batten on the outside with brick. Uh, this is a Tanglewood Stable Office, uh, another facility built in the 1920, 1960 region, like most of the um, buildings on the, on the campus there. This is the Tanglewood Park Welcome Center. So although it was built in 1991, uh, it still has the same kind of elements that you've seen in the other structures uh, at the park. And then you're all familiar with the Tanglewood Church built in uh, 1809. 
And so uh, following that, uh, this is the existing park clubhouse, um, which doesn't really speak to the same aesthetic as, as what we saw earlier. These are some more images uh, of, the, of the park clubhouse. This is looking at it from the rear, the part that faces the, the golf course. And then this is the uh, south view where you see the uh, go-kart, or the golf carts rather, <laughs> that uh, can't fit uh, underneath uh, the uh, current clubhouse because of how it's configured on the hill there. So this is the first uh, renderings of what the uh, Stitch Design has conceived for Tanglewood Park, for the new clubhouse. Uh, tries, to keep the, tries to keep the same uh, language kind of as the other facilities that there at the park, other than the, the current uh, kind of clubhouse. Uh, this is another view from the front. This is a view from the rear of uh, what they anticipate uh, at this point it can look like. And then you can see the space underneath is where uh, all the golf courts would be stored. Uh, you can drive them in and drive them out, and so none of them will be actually out in the weather. Uh, next steps, uh, the item that you'd be considering in this next cycle is for the selection of a construction manager um, who would then determine building constructability of those things that, that we saw just in renderings. Uh, they would provide a guaranteed maximum price for the board to consider, and then if that was uh, approved by the board, then the construction manager would then uh, manage that construction effort. So, so with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, James Anderson to come up and, and talk to you about the uh, construction manager at risk recommendation. And if you have questions for him about that or kind of where we are in the process, we'll both be available to help you with that. Mr. Anderson, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, the item before you, as Damon alluded to, is a resolution uh, to select and award a contract to Samet Corporation uh, for construction manager at risk services for the Tanglewood Clubhouse project. Uh, City County Purchasing advertised an RFQ for CM at risk services, and uh, we received eight responses uh, to that RFQ. After that, a selection committee comprised of general services staff, parks and recreation staff, uh, represented from the manager's office and uh, Pete Fowler from Stitch Design uh, reviewed and scored each of those responses. And from that scoring, we shortlisted uh, Samet, I.L. Long, Frank L. Bloom as the top three uh, firms and invited them to interview with the selection committee. And after the interview process, the selection committee identified and is recommending selection of Samet Corporation as the most highly qualified firm for the Tanglewood Clubhouse project. And uh, staff have negotiated a fee for pre-construction phase services in the amount of $27,500. That represents one half of a percent of the uh, expected construction budget of $5,500,000. And uh, the pre-construction phase services will include, but not necessarily limited to, uh, cost estimating, value engineering, constructability review, development of trade packages, and soliciting MWBE and non-MWBE subcontractors uh, through a rigorous subcontractor outreach uh, program. And then at the completion of the pre-construction phase, SAMIT will competitively bid the trade packages and prepare a guaranteed maximum price proposal. Uh, if that uh, GMP is uh, acceptable, uh, we'll bring that to the board for your approval to amend uh, the contract with uh, SAMIT to proceed into the construction phase of the project. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments? Just one question, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Fleming Alamine. That one half of 1% one is pretty standard. It is. That's our mass. standard that okay. we pay. All right. Additional questions? And I just had a question for Damien. I hate to put you on the spot, Damien, but they do have an aerial view of where this was going to be at the park. Uh, do I have an aerial view? I uh, didn't put one in the presentation. I but do have some in the back I can bring If you bring can send it, that, that would sure. help, be helpful for me. Thank you. Sure. Further questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. So we have some property matters, and this is going to be the Chelsea Swain show. So she's going to make her way up to the uh, front. We've got four items, uh, and I'll go ahead and introduce the first one. It's a resolution authorizing a lease agreement between Forsyth County and the state of North Carolina for lease of county-owned property located at 5580 Sturmer Park Circle. 
partner with Chelsea. Good afternoon, commissioners. This item is to authorize the ex execution of a lease agreement with the state of North Carolina on behalf of the Department of Public Safety to provide juvenile justice and administration programs. This is for lease of 4.68 acres at 5580 Sturmer Park Circle. This includes the old youth detention center facility and the Sturmer House. It's for a three-year lease beginning July 1st of this year, running through June 30th of 2024. It does include a termination ability for the landlord or the tenant, um, should we need to exercise that. It's for a one-year, a one-dollar annual rental rate. Um, however, the landlord would get, we would get reimbursed for grounds maintenance services, and we would charge $34.48 per hour for that. The tenant is responsible for all the maintenance and repairs, utilities, and janitorial services. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions or comments? Well, I, I, how long was the first lease we had with uh, the state for this that's now expiring? Three years. How many? Three. Three. We've actually had two, and this this would be the third one. And was, do we was know the, roughly what they spent for Upfit? No, I sent an email when Ms. Robinson asked me that earlier today, and I'm waiting to hear back from them. Because um, I'm just trying to get at because I, I understand we have some need for the for that space, and the question is, is I'm trying to, what kind of good faith, what kind of issues does the state think? I mean, I know the state needs it, um, but it's probably not serving many Forsyth County folks, and it did, we didn't have any need for a while. I understand it said empty, mm -hmm. and, and this was a way to put it to use to help the state, but now we seem to have a need, and I'm trying to decide why we need to let them keep using it for free if we've got a need. Additional questions? Yeah, um, you know, it really is a, it, it, it goes back to um, us with a decision around um, moving away, you know, both properties were really moving away from the juvenile detention um, work and now it's, you know, obviously the front part's the assessment center, the back part is a um, youth and transition facility. Um, uh, you know, it is there and available for Forsyth County youth. And so um, we, we, can, we can certainly move away from that if that's what you want to do. I mean, you know, it's... Um, well, maybe we could, should discuss the... I mean, I, 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 exactly what our use would be. Mm -hmm. and cause I know we've had some discussion about numbers of young people leaving the county, and it, and it used to be a more manageable number. Now that number is huge since the prosecution issues changed right, right, right. and folks going, they're not just going to Greensboro because Greensboro filled up and they're going kind of all over. And I thought, I thought, did, when did we, dis we discussed this at some point? I can't remember when we discussed it, but we had some discussion about it. And that's the, um, the old, that's the old detention center site. So the one that um, we were looking at for DSS youth is the actual house that's next to it. And so, you yeah, know, right. It, right. So as but part, this includes both properties. This includes both properties. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, if we have no, I mean, we could obviously split the lease into two parts. It could be the old detention center and the Stormer house, right? We could. could be two because there is some need on the, I think it's the kind of, some kids, some mental health kids where we need kind of almost like group home sort of facilities. Am I saying that That, right? that is correct. And so that was one of the things I was um, informing all of you about is that, you know, during the ARPA fund process, we will be submitting a proposal to build a facility within Sturmer Park, so essentially next to these properties for DSS youth um, in order to have placements for them um, while they are awaiting, um, you know, instead of being in the emergency rooms or the DSS lobbies while we are awaiting placements. So you're talking about the, a facility of that about the same size, the eight rooms kind of deal? It, it would essentially be about the same size as the Sturmer house. So does it make any sense to split the lease into two parts? Use it, we have the use for them, for, for, for those, those young people, and then we have a and our, I, we have an opportunity to, to continue if we're not going to use the detention center and the state's got to use for it that they use that is that yeah yeah so um 
we, I tell you what we probably need to do is let us work on that part of it. Um, so the, the agency that manages the assessment center is also, which is uh, children, the Children's Home. North Methodist Children's Home. Home for Children. Methodist Home for Children, thank you. They, um, so they manage under a contract with the state the assessment center, and then they, they manage the, the, the home that's there as well. Now, they, they have invested a fair amount of money in the facility um, over the last three years, and so they, they've dropped some dollars in that. And I think those two facilities, you know, because they're, they're the same group as actually managing them, they are really part of this whole juvenile justice center statewide. Um, we can certain, and they, I think we are intending they would likely be the, the home provider for this new facility. And um, let us talk through that with and get some information from them. I think that would be be helpful. Um, uh, let us come back to you next week on that. I got the concern, completely understand it. I've got some questions about how the two facilities that are there, the assessment center, which I think is important that we have it here in Forsyth County. Um, it was the... Uh, as the state was changing how they do youth detention really with an assessment tool and really taking a lot of kids out of um, confinement and trying to put them in um, foster homes and other type, you know, moving them away from the criminal justice piece really more into that social piece. Um, uh, you know, it, that was all part of that. And so I've got some questions about that before we answer that. that. But um, And it may be helpful just to get uh, uh, the leader of that here to answer those kinds of questions. You know, um, how, does, how does Forsyth County's kids fit into that system? How do they fit into that network? And, um, and kind of what we're doing there. The other change that happened that has impacted us is really changes of leadership over in, in, in Guilford County because when we, Forsyth and Guilford were both losing money in that, in that situation. Um, we, and it was, it was a largely in part because the state was, was, were taking kids out of that system, putting them in other, it was a good thing, they were putting them in other places. Um, so we, we had sort of dibs on beds at, Guilford that um, when COVID hit, they sort of stopped. In fact, they stopped our kids from going over there. I made a phone call to the manager and said, you can't really do that to us because um, we, you know, we were part of this whole deal. And so they gave us some beds back. Um, and, and you know, the manager's gone, a little change in administration. And so there's, um, you know, that, that system's a little bit in flux right now. Um, the other thing that the state does is they obviously don't want to put you know, kids who are in the same gangs and the same groups, so they move them around the state a little bit just because of that. Um, so it's it's packed into a lot of that and kind of complicated, but let us work on that. Okay, it's a good question, and and it deserves a, a, a solid answer. I just it, it's it's complicated. You mentioned uh, forty eight dollars an hour earlier. What was that for? $34.48. It's $34. It's the rate that we get grounds maintenance reimbursed. Cutting the grass, man. Oh, I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> you know, next time my son in law comes over, I'm going to have to give him $34 an hour. <laughs> That's the going rate, right? <laughs> and I don't live in uh, a big house, I don't think. <laughs> okay. All right, next item is also Chelsea's. It's a resolution authorizing the execution of a lease agreement between Forsyth County and the City of Winston as joint landlords in the Winston and Forsyth County Utility Commission for lease of county owned property located at 6315 Amp Drive. Um, this item is to authorize the execution of a lease agreement for tower space at the Clemens Tower located on Amp Drive. This is for the Utility Commission to install and maintain advanced meter infrastructure systems. And it's for a 20 year term at a $5,000 annual rent, so $100,000 over the term. And they would maintain their equipment. They have provided a site plan to interagency communications. They've reviewed that. There's no interference with our emergency communications that are on the tower or any existing tenants on the tower. Questions or comments? Okay. 
All right. Item nine is also Chelsea's. It's a resolution authorizing the acceptance of easements from the city of Winston related to the construction and operation of the new Collodium Museum. And then you got some Duke Energy Carolina easements that I think are the same thing. So just both of those. Um, the first item is the acceptance of easements from the city. There are 10 areas, one easement document, and these are just to operate Collidium. Um, we would have to maintain the landscaping that we want to put out. It's for storm drain installations, sewer service lines, and water service lines. Um, and all of these just allow us to proceed on with the construction of Collidium. And then the final one is for the Duck Bank Utility Easement with Duke Energy, again, for the new Collidium Museum so that they will have service at their new location. Questions or comments? I have one. Yes, sir. Ted Chelsea, is it possible to get the amount of money or the, the cost of meeting Winston-Salem stormwater uh, construction that's required for stormwater abatement that's required for the Collidium building? We can look into that, yes, sir. Thank you. And, and it also seems to me that once that's provided, why are we paying any tax on it? Because it has no more water runoff than it started. And we're going to spend a lot of money to do that in any site. And I don't understand why we should pay any stormwater runoff tax on it. I would agree with you, but that's a different government, and they are <laughs> hungry for money. You did a good job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> All right, we've got two uh, tax refund items. Uh, item 11, uh, refunds in the tax assessor collected amount of $1,403.92, the vehicle tax uh, system, and then $335.53, refunds over $100. Item 13, you've got uh, some other refunds under $100, and that, like I said, was a fairly lighter agenda than we've had the last little bit. So that's the agenda items. We can go ahead and dive into the uh, few discussion items if it's okay, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Fire the first, away. Yep, first one is Animal Services Advisory Board recommendations. It, it's been a bit um, since we, that, that's usually an annual thing. It's been a while since we brought these to you. Um, and it's really, um, you know, the Sheriff's Department's kind of taken hold of that department and still working with the advisory board. Uh, Damon's going to review it, and Van Loveland is in the back, and Van can can weigh in on some of the recommendations as well. So, yeah, Van, come on up if you will. Thank you again, Mr. Manager and um, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so, the short document that's entitled Psych County Animal Services Advisory Board Proposal uh, is intended to relay code change recommendations uh, from the Animal Services Advisory Board to the commissioners. Uh, so today's information session is to share these uh, recommendations. And then uh, if it's the commissioner's directive, uh, staff will draft an agenda item or items for your consideration in an upcoming commissioner's meeting. Uh, in the audience, or, or Priscilla Ivester in the back, who's the chair of the uh, Animal Services Advisory Board, and then uh, Captain Loveland, who is uh, the um, director of the uh, Animal Services Division of the Office of the Sheriff. Uh, so the advisory board just generally was created uh, to advise the commissioners on animal services related matters. Uh, traditionally, the director of animal services uh, worked for the manager's office, and the manager's office reports to the commissioners. So uh, it's a little different now in that the advisory board still has the same charge, um, but the, uh, the actual enforcement of animal services is the sheriff's office. So the, uh, they advise, the animal services advisory board advises you, and then the, the sheriff's office is actually running animal services. Uh, so the uh, one difference from the prior arrangement is that the uh, advisory board generally provided an annual report to the Board of Commissioners. So uh, haven't been doing that. However, uh, the Sheriff's Office does have an annual report that uh, they are providing. And so you can get that on, on their website. And then uh, in attachment D of what you have in the back, uh, you actually have a copy of that that I just printed off for you. Um, so jump into the recommendations. Uh, the Animal Services Advisory Board has submitted two uh, county code change recommendations for the commissioners to consider adding to a future agenda. So the first recommendation is to eliminate pet licensing, uh, differential or otherwise. Uh, so the advisory board believes that it creates an economic hardship for pet owners. Uh, pet owners may avoid having their animals vaccinated because that becomes a record that they have an animal and makes them subject to being licensed. Um, compliance has been traditionally low, um, and so the way licensing is pursued by the county or has been, it's been fairly low. Uh, it has been as high as 32% for dogs and 14% for cats in 2016, 
uh, when the county kind of last administered the program, which still isn't over 50%, and as low as 19.6% for dogs and 7.6% for cats when we contracted it out. Um, so the county replaced uh, its contract for licensing and rabies recording and added one and a half FTEs uh, for, to do it in-house at the Animal Services Division. Can I ask a quick, quick question here? Sure. How, how on earth do you estimate the number of com in compliance when you have no idea what the total number of animals are? And some people may be avoiding it because of that. Is it just based on the numbers that's really, the numbers that really, the highest we are? What is it based on? So there's a, a national uh, organization that estimates how many animals are in a community of our size, and then we knew how many animals we licensed, and so it was 32% of that uh, estimate. Okay. 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 Uh, so the uh, advisory board and animal services also believes that eliminating the licensing requirement would allow the officer of the sheriff to staff uh, and spend more time with public health, uh, helping with rabies control and uh, rabies record keeping as well. Uh, the second recommendation of the advisory board uh, is to amend the code of ordinances to allow animal services to require pet owners to have their animals muzzled, leashed, and under the control of a person 16 years of age when outside at all times when they have pending dangerous dog or dangerous dog appeals coming. So it would avoid um, repeat offenses or bites or other violations while somebody was waiting for an appeal hearing of a potentially dangerous dog or a dangerous dog declaration. Actually, that's the, uh, the second uh, recommendation from the advisory board. So those are the advisory board recommendations. There's also a county management recommendation, which is to advocate for a legislative proposal to create a statewide rabies vaccination database accessible by local animal services agencies. And so uh, what that would do is um, right now uh, people can um, or veterinarians are supposed to submit their uh, vaccination records or rabies records to the, to the county. But that's done at different times. So some do it every three months, some might do it monthly, some might do it every year, some might do it every three years. And so it's uh, very inconsistent. And so it's difficult to know which animals are actually up to date on their vaccinations when you just find them and they pick them up in the street for officer safety. Yeah. Um, and also- And I was gonna add that on, um, the, the statute actually stipulates that, this is how old the statute is, that, that it's produced in a three-part agreement, three-part form, with one form going to the person who's getting the vaccination, one to stay with the, with the, with the, um, rate, with the veterinarian, and one to go to the county. So it's... What's that? What did that call it? NCR paper? What it called? The three-part uh, carbon thing where you bore down. Yeah, that's exactly Man, that's what it is. And that's, so that's over twenty years ago, 20, 30 years ago, probably. When, if you just think about how much paper that the statute creates that much paper. <laughs> and so, so if that database uh, were created, and then veterinarians could upload their information to the database, then it would be accessed by animal services agencies. So it would also avoid where people um, are able to have their animals uh, vaccinated in a different county, and we may not know about it. And so this would basically be statewide. If your animal was vaccinated anywhere in North Carolina, then our officers would have a record of that in the field. Uh, by doing this, um, it would also um, create a standard, hopefully, reporting period so that you wouldn't have some veterinarians report every month, some every quarter, some every year, some every three years. So to have the statewide database, we would hope, could clean up uh, a number of um, uh, you know, faults with the database management for rabies vaccination just being done locally. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that, Dudley? Um, no, I think you're, think you're good. I, you know, the, the current, um, current situation um, is really easily fixed um, for a very low cost of the statewide database, and um, it's. So, uh, if you have any questions? I'll try and field those. Questions, also, comments. Uh, the chairman's here yeah, from the anyone? advisory board, and, and you're level. home free. Okay. So, uh, as a next step, um, you can consider the recommendations received from the staff as well as from the advisory board, and then just direct the staff on what you'd like to see. Uh, did, or if did you, you want, see anything? Did you want to introduce the chair of the advisory board? Maybe give her just a moment. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah come on. Okay. Good. The chairman of the advisory board, chairwoman, the chair. This is Ivester. 
uh, has been doing. Priscilla Ivester. Oh, good. You've been active a long time. So, so good to have you with us. Good to see you all again. Ma'am. <laughs> I'm Priscilla Ivester. I live at 2401 Rosewood Avenue in Winston-Salem, and I am currently the chair of the Animal Services Advisory Board. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have been doing over the past pandemic time mm -hmm. is we still are have, we're having meetings, but they were virtual. Now they're back to being on site. Uh, we have been interested in trying to resolve problems with regard to licensing, with regard to uh, the fact that we use rabies uh, uh, information to determine whether or not someone needs to have a license, whether they have a pet. Uh, so we have been discussing this in length for the, for a, for. A, the last couple of years, uh, when when uh, uh, Captain Loveland took over uh, as uh, the officer in charge of taking care of the animal shelter uh, and the rules, uh, he brought to our attention the fact that uh, there was a problem in licensing because the work to get the licensing done uh, was was uh, in in excess of the results we would get from the licensing and uh, the licensing in many cases has been shown to be a problem with low-income people Mm -hmm. uh, particularly if their animal has not been spayed or neutered. Uh, and then spaying and neutering the animal also has presented a problem for low-income people. So we feel that this differential licensing is a, a problem for most of the low-income people that we have seen. When I work on tribunals, where people appeal their citations. Uh, in many cases, uh, most of these citations are dangerous dog uh, type of, of citations. Uh, but when we are presented with the material, we also find out that they don't have a rabies shot, they don't have a license, in addition to having a dangerous dog or, or an, an animal that is considered to be a dangerous dog. And one of the problems has been that there is a time frame between when the citation is made and when the appeal is given to the tribunal to do. We have noticed that there's a lot of times when that dog will actually have another citation in between the first citation and the time for the uh, appeal. But we cannot put any restrictions on those dogs uh, before the appeal. Hmm. So what we would like is to have minor uh, restrictions to be able to be placed on the dog for public safety. And what we have proposed is that there, there, we would be able to, uh, to uh, require the owners to have their dog on a leash anytime it's outside, have it muzzled, and have it in the control of a responsible adult. That would not be a major uh, impediment to the owner in terms of being able to afford to do that, whereas some of the things like building uh, kennels would. But we feel like it's important. We've seen this enough now that we feel it's very important to have minimal restraint of that animal in between the time of its first citation and its appeal. That's for public safety. It's to keep the animal under control and it's to keep the animal from having a way to 
have a yet another citation or get out and, and cause problems. So we, that particular thing we would like you to consider uh, amending on, in the ordinance. Uh, we, are, we are supportive. I say I am, but the supportive of having a database for rabies that is current. And the only way that it can be current is, is to uh, have it updated at a regular basis. Uh, many times, uh, people go out of the county to get their rabies shots to avoid having to pay for a license. Or uh, the, uh, the license is too high for them, so that's why they either don't get their animal a rabies shot, which affects public safety, or they go out of uh, the county to do it. The, the uh, statewide rabies database would help with that, because then uh, everybody would be required to send it to the statewide database. Um, it's also important if we do this to uh, have a minimum time period allowed for reporting to the database because that we need to have it current. So the way it has been is some veterinarians report to us monthly, a few do. Some might report when they think about it. Some might report annually, but annually is not current when we're trying to find out if there's a dog that's had a rabies shot. We need a current time period so that we'll know that our data is good. Does anybody have any questions for me? No questions or comments for Priscilla Ibister? I've got a couple. Sure. Ted Kaplan. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you again. So, Part of that fee is used for spay and neutering other animals. Is that correct? Part, Part of which fee? fee? Licensing the fee. licensing fee, to my best knowledge, goes to the general fund. And, and do we know how much money that is a year? Uh, uh, I, can, I can get that Captain number Captain Loveland you. has some numbers hand. for you on that. And I think that uh, you may have some numbers, too, on that. So why don't I let them address the, the numbers game? Okay. <laughs> hey, any more I think questions he's got, I think for he's, me? Sure, they're ready to go. They were, they were coming up. Captain, do you have the numbers right behind it? Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Priscilla. Good afternoon, good afternoon Commissioners. How are y'all? So, uh, first, thank you for letting me come in here today, and I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity that y'all have given the Sheriff's Office to oversee these services in the county. And uh, one thing that I always like to look is I like to look at some of our processes and how we do things and constantly evaluate those and see are they still current? Do they still meet the needs of what they were intended for? And so that's sort of what we've done here. Um, I'm going to sort of go in reverse just a little bit, uh, do the easiest ones first, and then we'll talk about the licensing at the end. Um, on the statewide database, it, it's exactly what they were talking about where veterinarians are required to report to the agency in the county in which they reside so if someone lives on the county line and they go to a veterinarian in, in another county we never know about those animals getting vaccinated and so that's why a statewide database would really benefit all counties because then the, the veterinarians are putting in or, or the counties are putting into that database and we can all access it to find out if animals have been vaccinated or not because rabies is a public health hazard and it, it can kill someone um, if you've looked at our website we've seen about a 200 percent increase in positive rabies cases since last year mm -hmm. um, so as we develop more as a society and go into these wild air you know and take land from these wild animals, we're going to see more and more of them, and we're going to see more rabies cases pop up. So that's why we really support you know, us sort of making that push with the state to try to get something like that done. Um, on, the, on the actual amendment to 6-57, which is the dangerous dog portion, on that, like uh, Priscilla was saying, what we see is we see that you know, we have an, an, an animal that's attacked someone, and we issue them a citation. Well, by the ordinance, they have a right to appeal that citation. 
Well, when they appeal that citation, the way the ordinance is written is that there is a stay on all of the enforcement of that citation until the appeal is heard, which means we really don't have anything we can go on or we can't enforce anything until that appeal is heard. You know, it used to be when we first came in in July of 2019, there was about a year delay in hearing those cases. That's a long time. We have, uh, between you know, working with the advisory board and working with you know, the community, now we've actually got that down where we're hearing those appeals typically the very next month. The, more, the most times it's within four to five weeks that we hear that appeal. But we still would like something that we can enforce during that time period so that if that dangerous dog, the, the animal that's, you know, attacks someone, that if it's out there on the street, that we can have something that we can hold them accountable for until that appeal is heard. And we talked with the, we worked with the advisory board on what, what can we do that doesn't cost a lot of money, but still put something on that animal. And that's where we looked at, you know, doing the muzzle and the non-retractable leash and someone that can, you know, that can contain that animal that doesn't cost a lot of money, but it still gives us something to work with during that appeal process. So that's sort of those two things. On the licensing there, um, we've been working very close with the advisory board uh, and looking at numbers and all, and going back and looking at data, we've noticed that every single year, we've seen a decrease in licensing, and it, it's getting lower and lower. Um, from 2016 to 2020, uh, just over that four-year span, we've seen about a 29% decrease and licensing. Um, most counties that we have looked at that did licensing, most of them have done away with licensing because it really didn't do what they thought it was going to do, which was reduce the number of pets in the community. Um, to date, there are only four four counties left in the in the state that actually still do some type of pet licensing. Uh, most of them, like I said, have done away with it. You know, the whole intent when it was originally done was, you know, we would do this, you know, graduated licensing. If your pet is spayed or neutered, it's a five dollar fee. If it's not, it's twenty five, and that would entice people to get their pet spayed or neutered. But it really hasn't. We haven't seen those numbers really adjust, and more less and less people are actually licensing their pets. And unless we have you know, a, a band of you know, 100 people going out knocking on doors, we don't know how many pets are out there. Um, the number that we got from the American uh, Veterinary Medical Association, who has the formula based on our population here, is that they think there are somewhere around, I think, 90,000 dogs um, and about, um, I think it's, no, it's 85,000 dogs and about 95,000 cats in our communities here. We don't license near that many. Uh, there are a lot out there that we don't know about. Um, so what we want to do is if we can if we can move away from licensing and redirect our resources into spay neuter uh, spay neuter voucher program, which we have and we budget for that every year to offer low cost spay neuter vouchers, uh, and then also refocus into rabies um, so that we can focus on the public health issue and the pet population and really get away from the licensing that's not really doing a lot for us. That's where we want to redirect our services. Um, the great thing about the pandemic is, is it taught us uh, in looking at our processes that we actually can take our rabies clinic now and make it mobile, mm. um, which we can load it in a truck. And our plan is this year, as long as the, our numbers, if our numbers keep coming down on the virus, we want to get out into the communities and go to community centers and churches and offer the rabies clinic on site versus people having to try to come to the shelter to get a low cost rabies vaccine. Um, and, and that's one thing that this pandemic has taught us that we can do a lot of things like that. It's just redirecting our resources so that we have the time and energy to do that. And so that's sort of what we're looking at with the licensing. Any Back questions? Back to my curiosity yeah. question. How much money? So um, if, if you look at, uh, and the budget office did a, uh, did a memo, uh, if you look at when you take out the, the compensation and the salary for the staff that we have do that, it's on average anywhere between $110,000 and $125,000 a year that comes from pet licensing. So what's the gross? Uh, the gross, I think, is about one hundred and seventy, dollars on average. Datamax was doing this uh, when, when we first came into the, sh uh, to the shelter area. Um, they were taking about 36% of that, uh, and it was running about 10 minutes. They were about 10 months behind. Uh, we've since brought it in, taken some of that money that we were paying Datamax to fund a, a position and a half. Uh, we're currently still running about six months behind on rabies entry, but we're not going out to veterinarian clinics that do not provide us with their rabies da data information because. If we go out and say we need it, it's just going to sit there because we're, we're still behind too because licensing has to take priority because we're taking that money in and we have to get it processed and deposited uh, per state guidelines. Additional questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, yes, um, 
I'd like for us to consider these recommendations and put this on a future meeting at some point. Okay. I think we can do that if, if that's all right with everybody. Did I get did I get your question answered, Mr. Kaplan? Oh, yes. Yeah. Does any of the licensing fee funds they, they go to the general fund? Um, we, we have a separate line item in our budget that we budget for the spay neuter vouchers every year um, and, and the licensing the licensing money from my knowledge goes to I guess the general fund it's all general fund yeah right? so, so I got a call I got a call from somebody in Lewis mm -hmm. who said it was the time consuming for him to pay the licensing fee five bucks five so bucks if you're spayed or neutered though. yep and he would much rather just get a letter from you saying, please contribute to the and neuter program. They'd send you $25. We, we would love that. <laughs> so, is there a way, if you don't do licensing, is there a way to communicate with pet owners? Yeah, and so that's where we're looking uh, with, with if we can take our, our rabies clinic and make it mobile, which is what our, our thought and our plan is, is while we're out there doing rabies vaccinations, we're educating the public as well. And that's been our big push is, ma is educating the public on pet population, on rabies, on the county ordinances that they need to follow and all. And so if we can get out into the community with our rabies clinic, that now puts us in front of that many more people that we can educate on spay neuter and provide those vouchers at the same time. So if there was, let's say, a little check off mm -hmm. on your property tax, it says, do you have a pet dog? No fee, just check off those that. Yeah. Would that be helpful? That would for us, yes. It, it would help us get a, a more accurate representation of how many animals do we have here. You're still going to have a lot of those people that live in apartments and things like that that are not going to get a bill from the tax department that we're not going to know about. But it would show it would show us closer to an accurate example of how many pets we have, or how many dogs and cats we have. And it, I think you're thinking of a listing. I mean, because yeah. when you pay your property tax, you don't send a form back, but you do list property. And um, it, the, the the dogs and the, it used to be on the property tax years ago, and it got moved away from that. Yeah, because it used to be a tax. It was yeah. it was actually a dog. Be collecting tax. Just, don't know. Just know, yeah. Do you have a dog or a cat? So, so this the optional thing to, to list on, pardon me? Does the state require us to collect the tax no. on dogs and cats? No. No. no so to help with enforcement, to help with other programs, if that's one way we communicate with all the citizens of Forsyth County. Yeah. They're not going to answer that question because they're going to be afraid you're yeah. going to tax. And, and you, and you got to ask how many. Yeah. yeah. Which is <laughs> an and, embarrassing and for, question. And for our purposes, we're gonna, <laughs> we'd want to know breed and color and approximate age because okay you've got six dogs but we don't know what kinds of dogs those are so we would need a little more information than just how many do you have <laughs> yeah yes you're welcome sir additional questions comments all right thank you good for your job thank you very thank much you. Thank you, uh -huh. i just would you know we're talking about uh shots President of the United States has proposed today that the states look into giving everyone who will get a shot for COVID-19 will be given a fresh $100 bill. Think that'll work? Well, $25 doesn't seem to be working. So I don't know. <laughs> Race it up to 100 I don't know if 100 will do it or not. Okay. So it sounds like the marching orders on the recommendations are to get those back in front of you and, 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 and talk through some options. So we'll, we'll get to work on that. The last two items, and the hour is late, um, uh, on the diversity and inclusion resolutions and sent some information out through email earlier. We did get kind of two proposals back, sent those out, and you've got them in hard copy format in front of you. We can certainly go through those if you want to um, or talk or sort of deal with that kind of offline. And then the last issue was just a, um, uh, was some older business around meeting protocols. Um, had that conversation. We sent out uh, a summary of really what our uh, practice is and has been. Um, and so the question there is, you know, is that the practice you want to stay with? And do you want to formalize that in any manner? So those, those are pretty important items. Why don't we just delay that until our next meeting? And put that at the top of the top of the list, because one of them could be controversial if we if we're not careful and know what we're doing. I think maybe two of them for all I know. I see some head nods, but I don't want to assume anything. <laughs> so, um, 
I think I think we could certainly discuss those at the next briefing session. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Let me apologize again for I'm this one. I'm in uh, part causing that to come about. I won't take full responsibility for it, but I'll take my part. <laughs> okay. That sounds good to me. Do we have any other important dramatic items we need to discuss today? That is it. If not, Mr. Kaplan. Mr. Kaplan has moved that we adjourn. I second the motion. We adjourn. Thank you for doing that. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to yes, say. who needs to know and may not know, Don Martin celebrated his 70th birthday, which means right. he'll be 100 years old in three years, no, 30 years. <laughs>